Now, I happen to be one of those weird people who likes pineapple on his pizzas, but that kind of makes me wonder, what's the strangest thing you've ever had on top of one of your pizzas? How about absolutely nothing at all? Wouldn't that be strange? Just pizza dough and nothing atop it whatsoever. Well, just such an order is what gets the protagonist in tonight's story into a whole heap of trouble. How much trouble? Well, you'll have to listen and wait and see. My dear friends, this could just be the start of a new series here on Dr. Creepin's Vault. So, do you know what time it is? Yes, once again, it's time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink and listen. I never in my lifetime believed that I would get a second job working in food service. Well, times were tough for my wife and I. My credit was ruined, and our finances were plagued with a medley of last-minute calls and emails to postpone the inevitable, a disconnection of some form. In my mid-forties at the time, I decided to get a second job delivering pizzas for a major local chain. It was a minimum wage job, plus any tips that I may acquire on any given night. I had a reliable truck that was practically a second home for me. <laughs> I can live in this truck, I used to proudly exclaim. It was the mobile tool shed, as I used to call it. It was complete with tools, first aid equipment, lights, power converters, and a nice sized truck box to hold everything. I'd even drilled a hole in the floor right below the driver's seat that had a hose and an attached retractable funnel. The hose led outside under the truck. On long trips, I'd use the funnel to urinate. <laughs> I never had to make a pit stop anywhere. The sturdy, solid V8 was perfect for any abuse I'd put it through. It was a gas guzzler, however. I used to say that one could hear an audible glug glug as it greedily consumed gasoline whenever I hit the acceleration pedal. Well, enough about me and my background. Now, on to my story. I do not figure you'll believe my tale, but I assure you it's true and forever etched in my mind day and night. Aside from a healthy fear of heights, I'm a man of few fears. I don't believe in ghosts or the unexplained supernatural. Oh, until about three weeks ago. Even the loss of my first wife and my best friend in the same year forced me to question the very purpose of my existence. No supernatural words from beyond the grave had ever graced me, though. I was simply the most staunch skeptic I know. Spirits and ghosts are the weak-minded and paranoid fanatics to experience, not me. I'm not a proud or arrogant man, just a skeptic. I also have no irrational fears. Having vivid nightmares as a child had hardened my resolve and purged most irrational fears from my brain. So, my story starts on a typical Saturday night at the pizza place having just left my full-time job with a major home supply warehouse. I often disliked my full-time job, but the benefits that it supplied my wife and I kept me a loyal and <clears throat> unhappy employee. The pizza place was a relaxing and easy job. I got along well with almost everyone. I even listened to my favorite creepy pasta narrator while on my runs. Again, it was a great part-time job. My fellow drivers and I would often talk about how we were stiffed on a run. We would converse about the strange and funny characters we would encounter. We would also compare our tips that we received as well. Now, this here story that I've shared left the other drivers in a confused, almost comical state of disbelief. But this is not a comical story that I had made up for the amusement of others. This is a story that changed my entire belief system in the unexplained mysteries of the supernatural. On this typical Saturday night, all of us drivers were trying to get the kitchen cleaned up before that last minute rush. You see, customers can place online orders as late as 11.59pm when the store closes at 12 midnight. Now, this used to piss us off because it would delay us up to one or two hours when trying to get out of there at night. Well, this was one of those nights, and my turn was up. 
I pulled the ticket and scanned over the order to ensure that every item and detail for the order was correct. As I looked at the ticket, I was immediately puzzled by what I'd seen. Weird names, addresses, and numbers were part of the course, but this had me both confused and in awe at the same time. The order called for one plain pan pizza with no toppings at all. Now, when I say this, I mean nothing. No sauce, cheese, meat, veggies, just one cooked bare pizza dough. That wasn't the bizarre part of the order. The instructions stated that the toppings will be applied to the pizza upon delivery and arrival. George, my supervisor, and I figured this to be some form of prank. It wasn't uncommon for pranks to occur in these situations. So, I called the number on the ticket, and the man on the other line was serious, and ensured that this was not a prank, and that a nice tip would be in it for me if the delivery was conducted properly. The voice on the line was that of a terse, middle-aged Hispanic man, who I found vaguely familiar. I told my supervisor George that I would go ahead and take the run anyway. I thought again for a moment about the voice I'd just listened to, and still could not trace in my memory of whom it belonged to. I did, however, know it from somewhere. I then proceeded to pack the bare plain pizza up in the red canvas insulated pizza bag that delivery drivers use to transport food items in. The man on the phone said to go to the drive through Archway at the intersection of Park Street and Anders Road. We deliver pizzas in this area all the time, and I knew there was no archway of any kind out there. Well, or so I thought. At this point, I began to feel a sensation of creeping unease much like the sensation of swallowing a snow cone whole. I had a bad feeling about this whole thing, I then chided myself for my unease and paranoia. Besides, I told George, I'm very curious about this person, who it is and what kind of tip's in it for me. Well, good luck, George said apprehensively. Call my cell if you need anything. Will do, I said, as I left for the door, order in hand. Park Street was lined with tall oaks and various dense shrubs and undergrowth. Anders Road was a right turn intersection only that began at a stop sign. Go through the archway, the voice spoke to me in my thoughts. I was certain there was no archway there at all, because I'd been on this route numerous times and had never noticed an archway of any kind before. I pressed on along Park Street in my truck playing the voice over and over in my head. Where have I heard that voice? I kept repeating to myself. As I began to approach the intersection that was stated in the instructions, I began to notice something faintly ahead. I rubbed my eyes and shook my head in disbelief at what I was seeing. The faint image of a drive through gate began to appear. Now, when I say it began to appear, what I really meant is that it was materializing like the tiny flecks of gold as they appear in a treasure hunter's pan while sifting sand in a creek. The closer I drove in the direction of the archway gate, the more of it would materialize. I abruptly stopped the truck, put on my hazard lights, and then looked back to see if anyone was behind me. There was no one at all. I began to drive in reverse while keeping my eyes on the archway straight ahead. As I drove in reverse, the image began to slowly disappear. I gotta see this, I said out loud, as I proceeded forward again. When I reached the arch, it was fully materialized at this point. There was a gate that was slowly swinging open, revealing a dirt pathway that lay ahead. My headlights shone down the dirt road at a security guard directly in front of me. He held out his hand as if motioning me to stop. I did. How's it going tonight? How long... I began as the guard abruptly cut me off. Driver's license, please. He barked. I knew he was no cop, but I handed him my license. He looked it over and handed it back to me. Hey, what's with the attitude, dude? I retorted. 
He said nothing in response to my question. It's the last house on the left. Straight ahead, he instructed. Oh, thanks. Remember to look up what a sense of humor is, I yelled out the window as I started to drive onward. I was exhausted and in no mood to put up with any shitty attitudes at this point, especially from some stupid security guard. I looked in my rearview mirror in frustration, but the guard and his shack were gone. I stopped the truck and got out to get a better look behind me. He and his shack were gone. I was feeling a bit freaked out at this point. Hello? I yelled back. No response. An odd hissing sound was beginning to come from the trees and the bushes to my left. It sounded like whispers growing louder and louder. I decided to get my ass back in the truck. I didn't want to know what was causing this strange whispering around me. God, where the hell was I? I proceeded cautiously in what turned out to be about three minutes or so, until I saw a sign that said 4th Street. There was an odd assortment of homes to my left. A mansion of a home with two nine-foot-tall gargoyle statues was the first one I saw. Then a trailer home decorated with animal skulls and obscure tribal decorations at the patio. Then a modest one-story home painted yellow with a chain-link fence. Then another run-down trailer home, as well as a two-story home with two large pillars at the entrance. Then the house I needed to reach came before me. When I saw the house, goosebumps immediately went down my spine. It flooded me with disbelief and bone-crushing hatred. I felt like I was going to faint. The small two-bedroom home was just as I remembered it. My late wife's parents, Joe and Anita's home. The voice on the phone was that of my former father-in-law. I hated them for how they treated me and how they disrespected my marriage to their daughter, Melissa. Missy is what we call her. Missy passed away three months after we wed due to an aggressive, insidious heart condition. She was taken by her parents from the hospital the day before she passed away. She was not at my side when she passed on. And I was forever resentful of them because of this. The town that this house belonged to was over 200 miles away. And I would just driven up to it in a matter of minutes. I was utterly baffled at this and began to question my own sanity. The homes that resided on this street were out of place and seemingly did not belong together either, as they looked like they'd been here for years. An exciting curiosity began to arise within me. I'm about to be a part of something that makes no rational sense, I thought to myself. I checked my phone and there was no service at all, no bars. The reception of my smartphone was always crystal clear in this part of town. The temperature was very cool, as the thermometer on my truck read 54 degrees Fahrenheit. But it was September in South Texas, and my phone weather report said 88 degrees Fahrenheit. I had apparently crossed through some sort of portal or dimension. I put the truck in park and stepped out, and onto the dirt driveway. No birds or insect sounds were evident whatsoever. I stood there and stared at the house that had both haunted and angered me for over two decades. I needed closure, and I needed it in a bad way. With pizza bag in hand, I walked silently to the door. My heart was pounding in my chest like a bass drum, and my ears were ringing so loudly I could barely hear my own voice. I carried a machete at my side, in its sheath. I spent an hour or so sharpening it to a degree of almost that of a straight razor. It gave me a slight comfort in the event anything turned, well, dangerous, I suppose. I also owned a 9mm pistol, but didn't have a permit to carry it in a concealed manner. The machete would have to do, I suppose. I then took a deep breath 
and knocked on the door. I waited in apprehension for what seemed like five minutes or so. Then the knob turned and the door opened. What I saw stunned me because it defied all logic and reason. There they were, standing side by side. It was Joe and Anita, but something was definitely off. It took a second or two to realize what was giving me this feeling. They looked like they were in their mid-fifties, just as I remember them twenty-two years ago. The last time I saw them, it was the year 1995. Surely they should be in their seventies at this point, or possibly even passed on. But they look just like I remember them. I regained my composure. I have your order here. Uh, that'll be $19.35. I must have sounded so stupid when I said this. I wonder if they recognize me, due to the fact I'd grown two inches and gained about 60 pounds over the past 22 years. The answer to that question was promptly answered when Joe spoke. Vince, you look good. I'd grown and filled out nicely since 1995. You look taller. And it looks like you gained weight, too. You remember me? I questioned, with a tone of ambivalence. Of course, Anita said in that shrill tone that I always utterly despised. Um, how did you f Did you ask for me specifically? I stammered. We have our ways, Anita replied. What do you mean, ways? What kind of ways? I asked, with visible frustration in my voice. Never mind that now, Anita snapped. I remember how she was always so annoying when she acted like this. How did you find me? And why? I asked, in a slightly angered state. It will be explained to you when we begin the ceremony. Come in and meet our leader and saviour, Joe said cheerfully. I gulped nervously. Some kind of cult leader, I figured. Oh, they were always so obsessed with the charlatan healers of televangelism of the 90s and early 2000s. The deep resentment I felt for Joe and Anita was changing to a form of confused dread. Something inside of me, call it intuition, told me to go with them inside and not to resist them. After all, here I was in an unknown place, where... Some sort of portal exists. I decided to be cooperative and go with them, inside with a pizza bag in hand. Kathy will take the pizza from you so she can prepare the topping for it, Joe instructed. A middle-aged Caucasian woman smiled at me and took the bare pizza to the kitchen. Topping? Just one topping for the pizza? I asked. You'll know soon enough, honey said a Jamaican woman from behind me. I'm Demetria, she said as she held out her hand. I shook it tentatively. I'm Denise, said a heavy-set lady with a warm smile to the left of me in the tiny living room. And Amy is in the kitchen preparing the pizza, Denise said. Then there was a knock at the door, and an elderly man with a ball cap on came inside. Hey there, Pete, said Demetria. Pete waved at everyone, politely and cheerfully. Now we are just waiting on Malcolm, our leader, said Demetria. Oh, I'm so excited for you guys, chimed Denise, cheerfully while gesturing toward Joe and Anita. It became apparent at that point that they were to be the focal point of this um, ceremony, I thought. What's about to happen here? I can't be out on dispatch too long, I explained. Don't worry, huh? explained Demetria. You see, time stops in this place. I don't see, I said with visible apprehension and frustration. What the hell is going on here? Take it easy. Malcolm will explain everything when he gets here. Pete calmly spoke, visibly trying to keep me at ease. At this point, an aroma of cooking meat began to fill the living room. 
It resembled the smell of seasoned pork or venison. It was making me surprisingly hungry as well. I looked again at my phone, and it was still frozen. I was beginning to develop a cold sweat, and was fearing for my safety at this point. Everyone seemed nice and neighborly enough, despite the feelings I'd displayed toward Joe and Anita, who were obviously the focal point of this event. Then, in my peripheral vision, a tall man, adorned in a long, elaborate cape or gown, walked in. And when I say tall man, I mean, he was about seven feet tall, like an NBA basketball player. The gown was of a beautiful, silky black design, with some of the most elaborate embroidery I'd ever seen. His hair was long and black, and tied in a ponytail that reached his waist. The man bore a striking resemblance to an enormous version of Gene Simmons from the rock group Kiss. The embroidery on the gown were those of an intricate form of hieroglyphics that I'd never seen before. On his head rested a headband encrusted with what appeared to be rubies, emeralds, and sapphires. Joe and Anita, his voice boomed over the cacophony of noisy conversations happening all around me. Joe and Anita went over to give the tall man a reverent hug. Ah, you must be Vince, he said to me, offering an outstretched hand that was the size of a tennis racket. Um, yep, yeah, that's me, I said nervously, and shook his hand. He had the grip of an anaconda. Now, I like a firm handshake, but this was ridiculous. He was a truly massive mountain of a man. He was very polite, and carried an authoritative poise that emanated from him like a lighthouse on a stormy sea. Let us all come to the living room, Malcolm's voice boomed in his powerful, deep way. We will begin shortly, and you, my dear Vincent, will reside in the middle of the circle, instructed Malcolm. Joe and Anita will be inside the circle as well, facing Vince, he further instructed. Now. The circle that was prepared for this ritual was about ten feet in diameter and contained three triangles inverted inside of one another. Inside of the smallest triangle, and in the middle of the circle, was a painted blue eye peering upward. Someone with a fair degree of artistic talent had painted this eye. It possessed a startling degree of realism that immediately caught my attention. Malcolm further instructed everyone to surround myself, Joe, and Anita in a circle just outside the drawn one on the floor. Everyone was told to hold hands through most of the ritual. This was getting very creepy, and somehow I knew I was in this for the long haul, whether I liked it or not. Pizza's ready, called Amy from the kitchen. Each person, including myself, was handed a paper plate with one slice of pizza on it. But why? I wondered as I quietly went along with everyone else. This was peer pressure on an entirely different level, I thought comically. The pizza had slices of what appeared to be in the shape of a pepperoni, but was clearly something else. It had a deep brown and burgundy look to it, and it was fried and looked crispy. It also smelled coppery and metallic, but not bad. The following events that occurred can only be described as some kind of seance, and I was directly in the middle of it all. Malcolm directed me to stand with each foot on either side of the eye, and was sternly told not to stand on the eye under any circumstances. I did as instructed, and waited. I was in the dead center of the circle, and Joe and Anita were facing me inside the circle, and Malcolm was to my left. Amy began to pour a line from a bag of pure sea salt that surrounded the outside of the outer ring of the circle. Everyone gathered around the edge of the circle, inside the salt ring. And this is when everything began to get seriously freaking crazy. Do not leave the salt circle until I say it is safe. Do you understand? Malcolm said to me, while preparing some other things under his gown. What? I began, until he gently put his hand over my mouth, 
suddenly repeating loudly, Do you understand? As he repeated, staring directly into my eyes with his dark and almost black soul-numbering eyes, I said, Fine. Yes, fine. Gotcha. I figured I was just going to keep my mouth shut from now on, wait to see what played out. A part of me was excited to be, well, part of something that was out of my realm of rational explanation. I might as well make the best of this. May I ask what the pizza slice is for? I politely inquired. And what do I personally have to do with this? You'll know soon enough, Demetria replied, as everyone was seeming to avoid eye contact with me. Just follow any instructions Malcolm gives you, okay? Pete said. I said nothing, and just waited in nervous anticipation again. Malcolm began to chant loudly with his eyes closed. He was chanting in some unknown language that resembled Latin mixed with some African tribal speak. Or, at least that's the best way I could describe it. Everyone's eyes were closed, except for mine, as something began to sound like that whispering I'd heard earlier while I was driving up here. The sensation of what I can best describe as an electric anxiety began to thrum in my feet, and then rose slowly up to my head. The feeling was like getting that unexpected high that you get from laughing gas at a dentist's office, but more electric in feel. Definitely energy, though. I heard a moist sound that sounded like someone with their hands inside a bowl of ground meat directly below me. The eye was looking around and searching the room, then finally resting its gaze on me, looking down at it. Well, no wonder he said don't step on the eye, I said aloud for some reason, but no one appeared to hear me. Malcolm continued with his chanting as the room outside the salt ring began to fade into darkness. It appeared like we were in a cylinder of light, surrounded by complete dark. Forms and figures began to appear around the circle that surrounded us. Nightmarish beings. Creatures. I don't know what the hell they were, but they began to appear all around us. We were all being watched by these beings of all shapes and sizes, like we were in some sort of fishbowl. I saw something that resembled an eagle with a snake-like head and reptilian cat's eyes flying around in and out of the light. Bipedal figures with a gaping hole for a mouth and no other discernible features were walking and touching the circle. They were a pale beige color with red vein-like streaks coming from their gaping maws. A trunk of some unknown form rose from the sand outside the circle. It was roughly the size of a giant California redwood tree. It had a large, multi-jointed mouth with ridges of shark-like teeth about three feet long. It looked like a demonic sea lamprey. I was paralyzed with fear and awe at the same time. I remained perfectly still, but my head was looking all around. Smaller creatures were flying so fast and bouncing off of the boundary like some forms of exotic insects to a lamp on a hot, humid summer night. Well, my skepticism at this point was dissolving like a sugar cube in a hot cup of coffee. Malcolm spoke loudly. Let le pacto de sangre begin. Well, my Spanish was shitty, but I knew it meant some kind of blood ritual. Everyone began to eat their pizza, and... I was directed to do so too. The familiar taste of the buttery baked crust filled my palate, but there was also the salty, iron taste of the topping. Well, I've had some blood sausage before, and figured that this was what that was resembling, only slightly better tasting, like a pork taste. The aftertaste reminded me of when I was a child and put a penny in my mouth, that metallic coppery taste. Malcolm procured a shallow saucer-shaped bowl, pruning shears, some olive oil with some of those same hieroglyphs on the bottle, and a book of matches. He had a second pouch with seven syringes of some form of medication. Before I could ask what everything was for, I felt a pinch as a needle entered my jugular. 
I felt a rush of narcotic fluid in my system. Demerol, possibly. Maybe morphine. I was guided to sit down on the floor and saw everyone else do the same. Malcolm, in one skilled, decisive motion, grasped my left hand and then cut my pinky finger off with the shears, causing a slow spout of blood, like a slow, defective drinking fountain flowing into the bowl with the severed finger. He touched the stump with an ornate amulet and the wound was cauterized. The pain was dull and sudden, but distant and dreamlike. I was in shock and disbelief as I watched Malcolm repeat the process with each person in the room. Blood spurts, cries of pain and laughter began to fill the room. The blood splatter covered many of the faces in the room as they were all drugged and sedated but awake. Malcolm poured the sacred oil into the bowl of fingers and blood, lit a match and tossed it into the bowl. The flames lit immediately and lasted for about three seconds, and then the bowl was empty. El pacto de sangre is now complete, and the sacrifice has been granted, Malcolm shouted. At this point the eye began to emit a green mist. We welcome the beloved departed to come before us, he chanted. Slightly above the mist, a ghostly figure began to form right in front of my face. My jaw dropped, and I said something like, No! No way! in my dazed state. It was Missy, my late wife. She looked like she was when she was in her best condition. Hey, you! her apparition said. She always said that to me. I began to feel tears fall from my eyes as I said, Missy? She leaned forward and spoke into my ear and said that I was about to be sacrificed and killed, but I could escape as soon as the boundary began to disappear and the outside room started to reappear. And then she was gone in the blink of an eye. Now Joe and Anita can see their lost daughter at any time, Malcolm said as he looked up with his eyes closed. So this was what this was all about. I was spirit bait, I thought. The thought came to me in an instant. I'd had two spinal surgeries and had a strong tolerance for narcotic and opiate chemicals. Everyone, including Joe and Anita, were in a drunken, dazed stupor. And I was coming too, already regaining my bearings faster than everyone else. Malcolm was cleaning up the scene as the room slowly began to fade very gradually back into sight. I pulled out my machete and thought to myself, now's your chance. Everything that occurred next happened all in the span of about five minutes, but seemed like half an hour. I waited for Malcolm to turn his back to me, and when he did, he bent over to pick up something. I kicked him right in the butt and sent him tumbling forward in an awkward thump and I bolted for it right then without looking back. Demetrius' voice drunkenly rang out. He's getting away! He won't get far, Malcolm said, and smiled deviously. <laughs> he laughed. I began to run and stagger as well because I was still a bit medicated, but the door was unlocked. I made it to my truck without anyone pursuing me, which both surprised me and confused me at the same time. I jumped in, started the truck up, and smiled. I had never been so grateful to get back to familiar ground. I floored it. I saw the gate ahead, and then I saw two enormous figures running right at me. Oh shit, the gargoyles! They moved with an unholy grace and were magnificent in appearance. Giant humanoid figures with three-toed clawed feet and hands the size of basketball hoops. Their heads looked like the heads of a bat, with toweringly tall ears and enormous glowing red eyes and twelve-inch tusks jutting from their lower jaw. They were identical in appearance as well. They were side by side, about twenty feet apart in the clearing before the gate arch. I began to veer to the right, 
in hopes to fake both of them right. Only one of them fell for it. I passed one of them, and the other one I struck head-on doing about 30 miles an hour. It fell slightly to my left as it grabbed and tore off my rear-view side mirror and burst the driver's side window. Minute shards of glass sprayed shrapnel and are left a dozen or so small shallow cuts to my left cheek. I could feel the rivulets of blood on my cheek from the impact. My truck began to slow and skid to the right, but was still going somewhat forward. I knew that if I was stopped, I was dead meat, and Joe and Anita would get their sacrifice. I was not about to give them the satisfaction. A giant clawed hand groped and tore my shoulder, ripping it from the steering wheel. I was able to get it back on the wheel, however. It had sprayed my blood all over the windshield inside in a cascade of red dots. I could feel the burning flesh wound bleed steadily, but not too alarmingly, thankfully. I could take pain pretty well, better than the average Joe. I then grabbed the machete, and with all the adrenaline-fueled strength my right hand could summon up, swung it at a 45-degree angle at the gargoyle's upper wrist. It dug in about two inches. I heard a muffled roar at that point, and felt the gargoyle release its grip. The truck regained straight motion again, when I felt an immediate decrease in speed, and my tires began to spin. I was now dragging two gargoyles, and was down to about eight miles an hour. I slammed the truck into reverse and floored it again, feeling the impact of one of the creatures as I saw it fall back. Again, I put it in drive and hit the gas, and was now moving unhindered, and shot through the archway with a roar. I stopped to look back, and I somehow knew that I was safe at that point. One of the hands of one of the creatures breached the arch, and I saw it literally burn and disappear in a cloud of smoke. It roared and retracted immediately. After that, I never looked back. The restaurant was a mere five minutes away from where I was. I arrived at my usual spot and looked down at my hand, surprised to see that my pinky finger was still there, my shirt and shoulder intact. I walked back into the restaurant and looked at my phone to notice that, from when I'd left with the pizza until now, only eleven minutes had passed. Time stops here, I remember someone saying. <laughs> I laughed out loud when I realized this, and George came over to me and said, How'd it go? Get a good tip? I was laughing and shaking my head, and said, oh, Long story, dude. Long story? You got back pretty quick. How long can it be? <laughs> he laughed. And I said, Well, let's just say I was in some form of time capsule, I explained. George asked again. So, what happened? I asked him if he was a superstitious man. And he said, Yes, I am. About four days went by. And I'd shared my tale to a few of the drivers with comical disbelief as a response. Well, since then I've done countless hours of research about what happened to me and what kind of rituals these were. The pizza I ate was the ground up prepared preserved remains of Missy's heart. The man that performed the bizarre cannibalistic ritual, Malcolm, was just an alias. His real name was Dr. Arturo Ramirez a professor of forensic anthropology at a prestigious university. He was suspended and then released due to unorthodox practices of ancient blood sacrifices and rituals. He had a compound and a following of around 85 people, including those of my late wife's parents, Joe and Anita. As for how I was found and how the portal was created, those are still mysteries to me. I realize that hate is a strong concept that has influences beyond human comprehension, and I was almost the victim of this hatred on a level never thought possible before. I try to tell others that evil does exist, as well as spirits and supernatural realms that cannot be understood or properly explained. At around the four-day mark, 
I received a package in the mail at my apartment. It was a small box, about the size of a child's shoebox. It was wrapped in plain brown paper, with no return address. Inside was five bundles of crisp hundred dollar bills in quantities of ten per bundle, and a plain white note that said, Your tip. And the faint scent of my late wife's favorite perfume, called Calyx, arising to greet me. I smiled. Thank you, I said out loud. I never did speak about this to anyone again, that is, until today. Now it's off my chest, and it's time to move on. After all, I have more pizzas to deliver, and this means, well, more bizarre and fascinating tales to come. Well, what did you think of that one? Uh, that's the first part, and parts two and three have already been written, and they're up at Dr. Creepman's vault, all ready for me to read. So if you enjoyed that one, and you want me to continue this series, you know what to do. Drop a line underneath the vid, in the comments section, and of course I will at least read, and try to reply to as many as I can join in the chat, as I always do. Well, can you believe it? Friday already. We're into February. Wow, January passed very quickly, didn't it? So... You know, I will of course be back with you on Monday, but until then, I want you all to go out and enjoy your weekend as best you can. If you're working, I hope you have a chance to listen to these stories, and it helps the time pass a bit more quickly. But until Monday, well, time for me to say sweet dreams, and bye-bye. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook. Come chat with me on Twitter. Listen to the background music and download it, if you like, on SoundCloud. Drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt. And, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, Looking forward to seeing you all again real soon, so come check me out, okay? <laughs>